You do know that last song comes from when Moses was by the burning bush. And uh, the Lord says, take your shoes from off your feet for the ground you stand on is holy ground. We didn't ask you to take your shoes off this morning. Thank you. But this is holy ground. We are gathered in the name of Christ. We are opening his word. This is in, in very much a holy, sanctified moment determined by God in his grace for each of our lives. So take your Bibles, if you would, and join me yet again in Romans chapter 10. Uh, today, we are continuing to pause over this statement that comes to us in Romans 10, verses 9 through 13, which is the statement that Jesus is Lord. It's one that I have on my phone. I have a phone that has like a clock on it, and it has an always-on feature. So I always know what time it is, but at the bottom of that always-on feature, I have the statement, Jesus is Lord. You'll drive around the community, and you'll see various people have on the back of their vehicle, Jesus is Lord. And, you know, it's a phrase we use often in, in many ways, but often, I don't think we appreciate the fullness of what that means. So we've really been pushing down uh, within the context in which Paul wrote in Romans chapter 10, uh, the religious context of the first century, the scriptural context around it here in Romans, uh, the political context, which we'll actually look at today. And then next week, we're pushed down on more of a cultural context in the first century when this statement would have been given. So all that to say this, words really only have meaning when you put them in their proper context. When Paul wrote these words to these people in Rome, he knew exactly what he was doing, exactly how they would understand it, and exactly what it meant when they would confess it. We're just trying to appreciate that in our times together. The last couple of weeks this week, and Lord willing, next week together. So allow me to read again Romans 10, 9 through 13. The words here are just powerful in and of themselves. Then I'll have a word of prayer, and then we'll kind of step back into this phrase together. And so the Apostle Paul writes in Romans uh, 10, verse 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who will call on him. Verse 13 is the last. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you burdened the Apostle Paul to write to this church in Rome. We're so grateful that he has done so. It contains some of the richest teaching in all of the Bible about who you are, who we are, who Christ is, what it means to be saved. Father, thank you that today we get to open it up again. And may the same Holy Spirit who inspired Paul, the same Holy Spirit who has preserved this for us to have a copy today, the same Holy Spirit that indwells believers, the same Holy Spirit that gives understanding to your word, speak to us now. May your word carry the weight of thus says the Lord to us. Help us, Father. We are weak. We are needy. And boy, we need to hear a word from God. Speak, I pray. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said? Amen. amen. By the word, uh, the word amen, we sang that song too, didn't we? Uh, the word amen simply means God's truth. God's truth. That, that, so when you say amen, brother, you're saying God's truth. In other words, this is really true. And so, amen, God's truth. So we have been pushing down uh, on this phrase over the last few weeks, and we've looked at it in varying contexts. 
So over the last two weeks, we have looked at the religious context two weeks ago, and the confession, Jesus is Lord, is a confession of the fact that he is God. He is indeed uh, the kurios. He is the Lord God of the Old Testament. So Jesus is the Lord. He is God. And so this is part of what I would call the content of true and saving faith. If someone's going to be born again, there are certain things that need to be understood to be rightly believed for one to be right with God. And one of the things that we're called to believe is that Jesus Christ is God. Second person of the Trinity, Yahweh, God of very God. Last week, we looked at the idea that the given name of God when he became man was Jesus. He is Lord Yahweh, the second person of the Trinity, God of very God, who entered into humanity through the womb of the Virgin Mary and became known as Jesus, Yahweh saves. God of very God, man of very man, and he lived our life perfectly to be our spotless sacrifice. And he died our death in our place under the wrath of God on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. And he was buried. And as it says here, God raised him from the dead, victorious over sin and death and the grave. And so this confession, Jesus is Lord, contains the content of what true faith is. And it is what we just said. And so if you actually took that statement I just gave you, and if you were to look at the Apostles' Creed, you would discover, oh, that's consistent with what the church has believed throughout the course of time. The Athanasius Creed, if you were to look at what I just said, it, it, it parallels there as well. So this truth, this confession, Jesus is Lord, in the content that he is both God and Savior, is consistent with those who have put their faith and known salvation throughout the history of the church. If we will believe it, if we will believe that he died for me, if we will turn from our sin, if, if, if we would give our lives to Jesus Christ, confess him as Lord, and follow him with our lives, we would be saved. That's the statement, Jesus is Lord. There's the content of our faith. So this begs the question, I thought about this as I was putting this together, how much does one really need to know to be rightly related to God and be saved? And I thought a little bit about this because I gave you a healthy statement. It's one that the, that the church would affirm over the centuries. But how much does one truly need to grasp to truly be saved? And I thought back to when I came to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Billy Graham was preaching on TV. I knew that I was a sinner, that Jesus was God, that he came and he died for me. I gave my life to him in that moment. I didn't understand a lot. I had a very, very ignorant understanding of who Christ was. How much does one need to really know? How much of this truth needs to be fully grasped for one to be rightly related to God, to be saved? Years ago, there's a story, I'd like to share it with you, because I think it helps us to understand how little can be truly known to be truly right with God. And it actually goes back to the middle 1800s in London. In London, back in the early middle 1800s, there, the, the whole... Uh, uh, industrial revolution was happening and there was all kinds of soot and, and dirty areas and kids running the streets. And so a lot of churches were burdened for all these young people that did, had no parents and, and had no schooling. So they began to establish huge orphanages, huge wood buildings they constructed, a uh, metropolitan tabernacle where uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon preached. They put up a number of these large uh, buildings for the, for the children, these orphanages. Because they were often sponsored by churches, the burden of these orphanages were to communicate Christ to these children. And so one little song became a way of communicating the truth to these little boys and girls. And it went like this. Very simple. Three in one. And one in three. And the middle one died for me. 
and they would grasp the middle finger representing Jesus Christ and draw it to their heart to say, I believe it, and here's my life. So this was how they would teach these little ones. You know, growing up various ages, various stages of understanding, a lot of them come from terribly abusive backgrounds. A lot of them were just, just rascals and struggling. But three in one, and one in three, and the middle one died for me. That's how they were teaching these children. Well, as the story goes, one night a fire broke out in an orphanage. And this happened often because there were huge wooden structures and they used oil lamps for light. A fire broke out. The children knew the fire drill. Everybody quickly run outside and, and they would be counted off. Their heads would be counted off. And they would count them off. And they said there was one boy missing. This boy, they remembered, was a troubled child. He never really understood much. He fought them every step of the way. They went back into the old wooden structure, went up to the third floor, and there they found this little boy laying next to his bed asphyxiated. He died. But they found him clutching his middle finger to his heart. How much does one truly have to know to be rightly related to God? Little, little, that Jesus is... God, that he died for me, and here's my heart in life. It doesn't take a lot to be rightly related to God. So it, it, a, child, a child can grasp the beauty of salvation. But please hear me. If it is real, if the faith is real, that faith we need to understand is all of God. It's an operation of God in a heart, whether they be five years old, six years old, or 50 or 60 years old. It's true faith is an operation of God in the heart. Amen. Do you know I can coach you today to say, Jesus is Lord. In fact, let me do that right now. Say it with me. Jesus is Lord. And according to Paul, if you say that phrase, you're saved, right? But that's what he says. Yes. You see, I can coach anyone to give me that little three-letter, uh, three-word phrase, but just saying the phrase doesn't save anyone. It is a transformation of the heart out of which these words come. You believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. There was one day where Jesus had taken his disciples aside from all of the hecticness of healing people and everybody demanding on them. And Jesus asked his disciples these words in Matthew 16. He said, who do people say that the son of man is? And they said, his disciples said, some say you're John the Baptist. Others say you're Elijah. Some Jeremiah, one of the prophets. Then he turned to them and he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And this is Jesus' answer. Listen, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. So if somebody is truly going to confess that Jesus is Lord, it is an operation of God the Father in the heart. Jesus said, all that the Father gives me will come to me. So very much, this is an operation on a work of God in a heart. In fact, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 3, Paul said this. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except in the Holy Spirit. So yes, a child can be truly saved with a very basic knowledge. But if they're truly saved, that faith is an operation of God in a heart that changes a heart that comes out of the mouth and will finally wind up in the life. This is the reality of true salvation. It is not just three words you throw into the air, presto, changeo, you're saved. No. It doesn't work like that. There is a wonderful dynamic at operate, uh, operating by, because of God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, concerning God the Son, which comes to us through God's word and results in the transformation of a heart. And our public confession is Jesus is Lord. So the content is found beautifully in his deity and in his victory at the cross. But this statement, Jesus is Lord, should not simply be limited to the content of knowledge. It also talks about the conduct 
that is now meant to come out of our lives if this statement is true. That's where we're going to push down in just the next few moments together. Because right now, I want us to think together over just the next few minutes of the social and the political context of the confession of Jesus' supremacy, his ultimate supremacy over all. Jesus is Lord. That's what I want us to focus on in just the few moments together. So here we go, getting back to our context again. When Paul wrote these words to the church in Rome, he knew that it was going to be a provocative political statement. He knew that because there was in those days in the Roman empire, something called the emperor cult, the emperor cult. And this is where the various Caesars saw themselves as gods. In fact, on the money, going back to even before the birth of Jesus Christ, we have Caesar with the title, the Son of God. Caesar with the title, King of Kings. Caesar with the title, Savior of the World. We have, G- we have Caesar with the title, the Prince of Peace and the Lord of All. Well, where have we heard those titles before? <laughs> Christians took them and they applied them to Jesus. You see, what made Jesus and, and the followers of Jesus uh, such a threat in such a provocative movement uh, in the Roman world is not that they proclaim Jesus as God. The the, the whole Roman, Greco-Roman world was awash in gods. The radical and dangerous thing that they did was as they worshipped God in Christ, they proclaimed Jesus as emperor. That's what Jesus as Lord means. They were unseating the statements given to Caesar and they were giving them to another and his name is Jesus. This became a big issue in the Roman world. So Paul knew what he was doing when he wrote these words. He understood exactly what was happening. These titles, Son of God, King of Kings, Savior of the world, Prince of Peace, Lord of all, Jesus is Lord, These became titles of worship for Christ. It became a dangerous and provocative movement, costing thousands of Christians' lives. Welcome to the first century, where Jesus is Lord, will get you put to death. I actually have a lovely little book somebody wrote. Uh, They were doing some lectures, I think, at Princeton. A little small book. It's called, Why Would Anybody Be a Christian in the First Three Centuries? It, the, so the basic statement is, uh, okay, you, you want Jesus? Do you understand what that means? It means that you will lose your job. It means your family will now disown you. It means there's a good chance you will probably be run down and put to death. Are you sure you want Jesus? Sign me up. Millions did. Millions came to Christ in spite of the persecution because they found in him what they could not find anywhere else, hope. A savior, somebody who would forgive their sins, somebody who promised them eternal life. So, so this statement became a, a came to loggerheads with the greater Roman world. And the reason is because there was a clash of cultures going on. Follow me here. The word cult, the word cult refers to the life and the rituals that rise up around the worship of a god. And in Rome, Caesar was God. And the way of life that rose up around him was the dominant culture. So a culture that we often refer to is nothing more than the outworking of a lifestyle built around that which you worship. And in Rome, they worshiped Caesar as God, and there was an entire culture that came with that. Christianity came along, 
and it promoted a radically different way of life. In fact, the, the Christian followers were known as people of the way. They didn't just believe Jesus. They didn't just confess Jesus. They followed Jesus with their lives. And the way of Christianity came loggerheads with the way of Rome. These two cultures were were hitting each other, and they were at odds with each other. That's what disturbed Rome. These Christians are promoting a radical different culture than the culture we want. Does that sound familiar today? Nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. So looking into the first century just a little bit, the way. The way was a new way of life. Think about this with me. Christians lived very differently than the culture of the first century. We actually have a marvelous letter that was written in the second century. And it was written to a a, a Greek Uh, from a friend who was trying to describe to him this movement called Christians. And so we still have it today. It's called the Letter to Diogenes. The Letter to Diogenes. And it's, it's a pagan describing to a pagan what a Christian is. And so according to careful investigation of Christianity, this is what he said. Jesus is Lord has huge implications. Christians live radically different lives. This is what he wrote. They dwell in their own countries, but simply as sojourners. As citizens, they share all things with others and yet endure all things as if they were foreigners. They marry as others do. They beget children, but they do not destroy their offspring. That was a marvel to them in the second century. What is it they don't like put their children out to the weather and let them die in the elements? That's just normal. That's what everybody does. But the Christians didn't. They have a common table, but they do not have a common bed. Even in the first century, that was a common realization within the people of Rome that you just did that, but Christians wouldn't do that. They would feed you, but they wouldn't sleep with you because this would not honor God. So this was this guy's appraisal of of Christians in the first century. He goes on to say, they are in the flesh, but they do not live after the flesh. They pass their days on earth, but they are actually citizens of heaven, they claim. They obey the prescribed laws, and at the same time, they surpass the laws in their life. They love all. They are persecuted by all. They are poor, yet they make many rich. They are completely destitute, and yet they enjoy complete abundance. They are reveled, and they they bless. Uh, they, They are reviled, and they bless. They do good. They are punished as evildoers undergoing punishment, and yet they rejoice as if they're being brought to life. And this new way radically threatened Rome to the point that it became a source of such irritation that all they could think about was erasing this this virus that's in the Roman Empire that is taking away allegiance from the Caesar. This is the first century. This is to whom Paul wrote into As a wonderful man of God who's now with the Lord, who's a powerful force early in America last, last, in the 1900s, J. Gresham Machen, he stood against liberalism in the church. He said this, he said, the early Christians lived a strange new kind of life, a life of honesty, of purity, and of unselfishness. That wasn't the culture of the day. But that's the way Christians lived. So in the first century, there was this clash of cultures. The way, the way of Christ, Jesus is Lord, had radically transformed how people were now living out their lives. But it, only, it didn't only change how they lived. Christians also died differently than everybody else died. Because Jesus is Lord. He has won the victory over sin, death, and the grave. This meant that Rome had lost its ability to control the Christian population. Because the way that Rome ruled was through fear and the fear of death. And they would come and they would say to Christians, bend the knee to Caesar or we will kill you. And their response would be, great! 
Because the grave is nothing more than a door into the presence of my God. Radical transformation. These people, Rome lost its ability to manipulate and control people. How do you deal with the people who are happy to die? That's their only ability to manipulate and to control early on. And so Rome, in an effort to really push down and to make it plain that they were not playing, they inflicted great suffering on the followers of Christ. Many were beheaded. Ask the Apostle Paul how that felt. For he was beheaded in Rome. Many were crucified. Ask the Apostle Peter how that felt. He was crucified upside down in Rome. Ask what it's like to be banished. The Apostle John could fill you in on what that was like. Because this is exactly what happened to all of them. Many were sent into the games to be eaten by wild animals. And others were sport for gladiators. And they went cheerfully. Oh, this Jesus thing. It's incredible. Absolutely incredible. It changed how they lived. It made them different than their culture completely. And it changed how they died. It made them different from their culture completely. Rome had completely lost its power over Christians because they knew and they proclaimed in lips and in life, Jesus is Lord. They understood what that meant. This should be true of us today, by the way. This should be true of us today. Listen, please listen. Jesus is today the Lord of all lords. Jesus is right now the king of all kings. He declared after his resurrection in Matthew 28 and verse 19, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Where Satan had usurped God's rule over his creation, Jesus through his death on the cross and his resurrection not only defeated sin and death in the grave, but he also defeated Satan. He crushed the serpent's head. He defeated him. He's now under Jesus' feet. And Jesus today is seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. And so are we. So are we. If you are in Christ, if you have repented of your sin and turned to him and given him your life and trust him as your Lord and your Savior, listen, Ephesians 2, 5 and 6. Even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. For by grace you have been saved. And we have been raised up. It's past tense. We were raised up with him and we he seated us with him in heavenly places in christ jesus jesus won (laughs) jesus won the war is over and if we are in christ we've won and the war is over this is the truth of the fact that jesus is the lord he is the victor And in him, we are the victors too. Philippians chapter 3 verse 20 reminds us that we are, our citizenship is in heaven from where we await our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are now citizens of the kingdom of God. And soon and very soon the king is coming to completely destroy all his enemies and to fully establish his rule on this earth with his people. Jesus is Lord. Presently, we are dual citizens, living in a world that is still in rebellion against our God and King. And thus, by extension, it hates us because our highest allegiance is to Jesus Christ and not to country and not to King and not to Congress. Our ultimate allegiance is to Jesus Christ. And this dual citizenship comes with enormous challenges, doesn't it? It has always come this way. The people of God throughout the centuries have wrestled, how do we live in a day for Jesus as Lord in light of the fact that the Caesars or some despot continues to want to rule? All I can say is this. And this is such a good out. Here we go. 
The Apostle Paul will actually carry on this discussion in Romans chapter 13. And so when we get to Romans chapter 13, we'll actually push down on a lot of this and, and try to make sense of, of a lot of the challenges that go with this. So in other words, I don't have to solve all the problems here and now or answer all the questions here and now, but rather we will consider a lot of the implications when we ultimately get to Romans chapter 13. But what I want you to get this morning is that we have been given a radical change of worldview. If we truly understand that Jesus Christ is the Lord of all lords, that he is presently, as Rome, uh, Revelation chapter 1 tells us, he is the ruler of the kings on earth. He is now exercising his authority everywhere, even though it looks like everybody else seems to be doing their thing. Oh, no. Oh, no. He's very much in control even now in exercising his authority over this world. The truth, Jesus is Lord, is meant to change how we view all of life, how we live this life, right down to our attitude in death. That statement is meant to be all-controlling. C.S. Lewis, some time ago, made a statement, and I just thought this is, this is a good time to use it. C.S. Lewis said this, I believe in Christianity uh, as I believe the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. This is Christianity. Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. But from that place, that position of his lordship, I can now see everything else. And what I see is he is ruling. He is reigning in the hearts and lives of his people right now, in the lives of us. He's ruling and he's reigning. And the church is the kingdom of God on earth. We are the outpost of God right now in the world. We are the embassy of the Lord here and now, the church is. And he's ruling in our hearts and lives, and he's letting the world free reel into their own destruction right now. Don't think it's out of control. He's giving them over to their sins. But he rules. He rules even now in our hearts and in our lives. Let's see. I've only got 12 more pages here. How much further should we? I, I was serious. When we get to Romans 13, we'll actually push down. But I just want to kind of end with a few thoughts. Today in America, yes, I had to get around to that eventually. Today in America, we are, are embroiled in a cult, sure, war. Actually, no, Christ won the war. We are involved in merely a skirmish these days. And yet, the varying gods and the varying cultures are all looking at the church with different eyes. Some want to recruit us. Others want to destroy us. But let's be clear. First of all, there is the secular progressive cult church everywhere around us. The left wants to banish Christianity and to destroy the family. I'll say that again, just in case you didn't hear me correctly. And I will say it on YouTube. The day will come where we will be booted, and that's okay. The left wants to banish Christianity and to destroy the family. Because God and the family are the longest, strongest bulwarks against the all-encompassing, all-powerful utopian state. Thus, they desire to destroy us, which is their end game. They demand that the government be God. Just like in the first century, just like with Caesar, they demand that of us. And there are churches capitulating everywhere. Yes, yes, you want us to burn incense to the government? Here we go. But no, no, that's not what we are to do. Um, I, I like the quote by G.K. Chesterton. He said this, abolish the God 
and the government becomes God. That's what's happened in our culture today. People no longer worship the true and living God through Jesus Christ the Lord. They have now turned to the government to meet all of their needs, to be their hope and their future. How does that go? Not so good. Not so good. But they cannot tolerate us because we will say with our lips and live with our lives that Jesus is Lord. He is the emperor over all. So the secular progressives want to kill us. Amen? Just want us to know where we stand these days in light of this, this truth that Jesus is Lord. They don't like it, and uh, it's going to come against us. Now, let me move into another couple of places, and then we'll call it a day. Secondly, there is what I would call the political conservative cult. Sure. Notice how I pause, cult, sure, because there is a worship that goes on in, in political conservatism, and they want to rally Christians. Come on, let's fight the fight. Let's take it back our country, and we'll go back to conservative values. It's a lie. It's a lie. Now, there's an old saying. How do you know a politician is lying? His lips move. Today, you know a politician is lying if they have a pulse. That's just the way it is today. Every word that comes out is a lie. And so we have our politically conservative culture here in the States. And they say, come on, Christians, jump on board. We, we, will, we will rescue this nation from where it's headed back to conservative values. But don't be misled. So the conservative values of the 1950s are not the conservative values of the 2023s. Amen? Because conservatism only tails progressives only by about five years. So what we are today in the conservative movement is what the liberals were about 10 years ago. That's all that it is. Especially morally, they've completely cast off any moral constraint. And they said, now let's just give our way uh, over to the polls and, and, and let's consider politics and free markets and libertarian values. But they want nothing to do with Jesus Christ. They want nothing to do with his word, his worship, or his way. Conservative claims are not Christian. I just want to make that known. Now, when it comes time to vote, oh, do vote. That is an obligation as a citizen of the United States. Remember, we're dual citizens here. Exercise your right and responsibility as a citizen to vote. And I hope you would vote somewhere in the conservative area that's closest to what God's word teaches. But do not be fooled that that's why we're here. That has nothing to do why, with why we're here. Voting in an election or taking back this country is not what Jesus is about. I just want to make that known. Our alignment is not with political conservatives. It's with Christ. Our alignment is not with Fox News or the Daily Wire, but with God's word. And these things are completely different. American political conservatives will never acknowledge Jesus is Lord, and in many ways they are just as ungodly as the secular progressives. And I just want to make that clear. As followers of Jesus Christ, our allegiance is to Christ. Amen? Amen. There'll be all sorts of other people vying for us, recruiting us, wanting to destroy us. But that's not who we are. It's not where we go. Now, I'm going to give one more. We talked about the secular progressive cult, sure, uh, in their desire to banish Christians and get rid of us. Uh, we've talked about the political conservatives and their desire to recruit us. Come on, we're all in this together. No, actually, we're not. I'm in Christ. I'm already seated in the heavenly places. We're not in this together. Very different things. Thirdly, not just progressive seculars, not just political conservatives, but now there's another movement, and they are called the Christian nationalists. I suppose you've heard of them, have you? Christian nationalists. Uh, this is its own cult, sure, uh, as well. Uh, many of these people are what we would call post-millennials. Millennials being the millennial kingdom, uh, they believe that it is the church's responsibility to bring in the kingdom of God through the proclamation of the gospel. And once the kingdom is established, Jesus Christ returns. That's how they think. So their goal is to win politics, take territory, and, and win countries and cultures over. They want Christendom back. That's what they desire. Uh, there are many reasons why I disagree with that, and, uh, we, but we don't need to go into all of them right now. All this to say this, they want to call the government to task. They want to demand that the powers that be be willing to subject themselves to the power that is 
the lordship of Jesus Christ. Let me just say, bless their hearts. <laughs> and ain't going to do one lick of good. I just want you to know that. So, but they are looking for recruits. Come on, church, join us. Conservatives, join us. Progressives, die. <laughs> so these are the realities in the world we find ourselves in today. In light of the fact that Jesus is Lord, how now shall we live? Dear ones, in acknowledging the lordship of Christ in our lives, we are claiming to be his. We are under his rule and under his rules. Our hearts belong to him. Our allegiance is to him. We are those who will live his truth. We will live obediently to God's commands. We will speak truth. We will not cower in the face of a cancel culture. We will live it, we will speak it, and we will honor God and thus fulfill the great commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. And we do that when we speak truth to them. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 says, truth rejo uh, love rejoices in truth. We have turned love into a mushy thing where we just let people do whatever they want. And we say, God bless you. No, God's damned you unless you repent. We need to be honest. We need to speak truth into the world in which we find ourselves. We live truth. We live obediently to God's commands. We speak truth. We don't cower from speaking the truth. We honor God. And we do so with a clear conscience before God and with no fear before our adversaries because they can kill the body. And that just sets us free to be with Christ. This is the reality of the first century. When Paul wrote this into them, that's how they understood it. It was going to cost them. Jesus is Lord. And yet, they were able in 300 years to overthrow the greatest empire on the face of the earth, the Roman Empire. How? Through the gospel of Jesus Christ. One heart, one life at a time. Dear ones, Jesus has no interest in winning this culture. Jesus has no interest in winning this country. He has no interest in winning the Congress. Hear me. Jesus said, I will build my the church. The church is what Jesus is about today. If you want to be working for Christ, then Give your heart over to the church and live in the church and love in the church and reach out to those who need Christ. Preach the gospel. This is our mission now. Not to link arms with every other group around there trying to win back this country. That's not our mission. It has never been the mission of the people of God. Our mission is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and to see people one heart, one life at a time as God brings them to himself. It's a work of God. Into the church. The Greek word for church is ekklesia. Ek means out of. Klesia is to call out. So the church preaches the gospel to the world and God calls out individuals, one heart, one life at a time, out of the world into the church. This is Christ's body. This is his mission today. Not Congress, not this country, not the culture. It is the church. I will build my church. And the very gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So when we come to loggerheads with the greater culture, and it's coming more and more. We'll talk more about this in first, when we get to Romans chapter 13 where we bless them, where we love them, where we do good to them, and they will hate us all the more for it. That's when that little statement becomes very real to us, dear ones. At any cost, we will read God's word, pray, 
worship the true and living God, gather with other believers and witness for Christ, and nothing will stop us from doing these things with willing and glad hearts. When push comes to shove, Jesus is Lord. That is what the first century understood, and they were powerful. That's what we don't understand today. We've become so politicized. We've lost all our power. Again, we will talk more about that when we get there. There are two words that will sum up our relationship to the world. I'll just give them to you, and then I'll leave it with you, and we're done. The word is compliant. Compliant. We will be the most compliant citizens in the United States of America. But we are also the most covert citizens of the kingdom of God. We are submissive to the powers that be, and we'll talk more about why both Paul and Peter spoke in such a manner. But we are also subversive in the greater world, calling people to the lordship of Jesus Christ. This is our role in this world. Compliant yet covert, submissive but subversive. Let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, for your wonderful approval of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. He bore our sins under the wrath of God and was put to death. He was buried. He rose again the third day. He is exalted to the right hand of the majesty on high, and the day is coming where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We thank you that we are the few who have bent the knee now and acknowledge him now as our Lord and have come under his rule and his rules in our lives. Help us to see, O oh God, how we are now to see everything in light of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. May it cause us to look at life differently, to look at our lives differently, and to look at death differently. May we be those who are radically following Christ. Help us, O oh God, to grow in our knowledge of the reality of these truths, I pray. In Jesus' name.